So tell me about the automatons. <laughs> we thought we had them, Cameron. We thought oh, we had them. We thought I've we been had out of the game, run, man. I, I was on block leave. I was I was on holiday block leave, uh, <laughs> taking a trip to Super Earth. Uh, tell me, fill me in. What happened? I mean, we thought we wiped them out, man. We uh, we had them on the run. Operation Swift Disassembly was was a go. We 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 got it all taken care of, and there was a, a moment of peace, a moment, a breath of fresh air within the universe. Uh, mm -hmm. for freedom and democracy but then they came back with a vengeance man they they counterattacked and they blocked there's like three sections three blocks of the universe that are all sectioned off now and we got to get them oh, back God. we only got like as of the as of this recording it's not looking too good because they seemed i don't know if maybe i've just like lost some skill in the past like day or two since i played but they are better shots they seem to explode more aggressively when you kill them it, which which means killing you in the process and those fire yeah. tornadoes man there's like five, certain planets have different planetary conditions and those yeah. fire tornadoes are not fun. I was not having a very good day today. Oh but man, that's that's terrible to hear. I'm I'm sorry I totally missed the invasion. I feel like uh <laughs> I'm not I I'm not a dodger. I'm not a democracy I dodger, I swear. Know, you better get back on that ship, man. I have. I gotta start diving ASAP and that bring become an asset. That's right. That's right. But dude, yes, yeah, that's crazy. You know what I appreciate? Uh, blah, blah, blah. You know what you I appreciate? appreciate? About, like, I appreciate. Yeah, I do appreciate once a day. Um, but uh, <laughs> I really appreciate uh, the fact that like the game is ongoing and it's it's like a joint effort. It's not just yeah. that is the storyline. I've never seen a game like that. Have you? Is there any games? I, mean, I feel like Destiny is the only one that comes to mind in which there are events that never happen again. And if you are a part of that event, then you can talk about it. You can kind of share that experience with other people that were part of it. And then it goes away and then you're on to the next thing. So I, I think that's part of the magic of Helldivers too, is that there's an evolving storyline and things ebb and flow. And if you're a part of it at, at certain points, then you can be like, yeah, I was, I was at Malevolent Creek when it fell, or I was at Malevolent Creek when we liberated it and I'm sure it'll fall yeah. again, you know? So hopefully more, the people have really seemed to, to have taken to this game in such a way that they're making memes about it. They're making videos about it, you know, like our, our little, you know, stolen valor video that we made like yeah. that just kind of, it captures the imagination and it lends itself to fun, creative kind of things. It's kind of, it's, it's fun. It's cool to be a part of. So yeah, it is, man. It, it, it makes you feel, it doesn't make you feel empty. Like some yeah. of these TV shows and movies we're about to talk about. Good segue. That's uh, right. That is. We don't need to ask for closure. And yeah, that's, that's exactly right. what this episode is about today. We're going to talk about some movies and TV shows that just we couldn't get over, you know? Right. The the type of TV show and movie you just want to invite to coffee two months later and be like, I just need... <laughs> I just need to talk about this. <laughs> so really closure. I need, we need to, I just got, I have something in my soul. Just can't rest until we have a little bit of, until we have a talk about what happened between us, you know? Yeah, exactly. So I know you've assembled an amazing list here. I've tried to add, but you've hit a lot of these points on the head. There's a lot of pop culture out there that has done, you know, that has had a terrible, terrible ending or just didn't really do it for you. Right. Man, or no know. ending at all. There, sometimes no projects, movies, especially television shows and video games, they will have an intention. And then for whatever reason, business reasons, money reasons, creativity reasons, they won't finish the thread. They won't finish the storyline. And you're just left hanging. All the fans yeah. of whatever. Um, and, and shows, I feel like shows are notoriously difficult to end, especially popular shows. Uh, the most recent example would be something like Game of Thrones, right? Where oh, it was this international yeah. box office or international success. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was wondering what the next episode was going to hold, who was going to die, who was going to live. And then that last season, man, boy, that is a case study in how to fumble at the five yard line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is prime example, man. So do you know... I know we've talked about Game of Thrones in the past, but like, okay, so the guy, 
I was under the impression, like, obviously the guy that wrote it ended up getting cancer and died, but that was far from the actual case, right? Wait, he are we just... talking? What, were we talking about Game of Thrones or Wheel of Time? Oh, you, you we were talking about Game of Thrones, right? How yeah, Game of Thrones. Right? No, Game of Thrones. Yeah. George R. R. Martin is still alive. It's yeah, just exactly. Probably never going to finish the series because I don't know. He's getting old. He's a, he's got all the money in the world now. He's doing other projects. He doesn't care about Game of Thrones. They already finished the TV show. You know. Yeah. No, so. that's what I'm saying. Is like. I thought because I heard about it and they're like, oh, there's no book like the final season. There's actually no book that they're going off of. There's no actually written anything. And I'm like, oh, it's because the author must have died or something tragic happened to him. And then I've come to find out he's just super lazy, you know, yeah. <laughs> ultimate disrespect. Yeah. Yeah. I've told the story about I, I had a friend that was that would do some personal assistant work for him, like go to his house at an undisclosed location in New Mexico. Yeah. And and do whatever. And I, I think uh, like somebody asked her one time, like, is he do you ever see him writing? She's like, he's never writing. I never see him writing. And she's yeah. there like all the time. He's either he's either off doing stuff. And and I don't know, I guess partly I can understand when you, you're getting old and you've you've had so many accomplishments in life and you're you're getting up there in age. You're not going to live forever. You kind of start thinking about like, what, what do I want to do? You know, yeah, my life and I've got all this money got all that sweet sweet game of thrones cash yeah i'm just, just gonna go travel the world and write other series and write other projects or whatever i don't yeah, know yeah or just pick up woodworking That's a very <laughs> expensive, expensive hobby there yeah. yeah i do you do have an obligation to i think he does have an obligation to finish it when we're talking if we're talking about game of thrones george Armada has an obligation to the fans and to i don't know if the publishers are on him about it or if he has some sort of open-ended deal yeah but I, and I and I think he has an opportunity, a moral opportunity, because season eight was a massive, massive failure, in my opinion. It was it was it was so bad how they ended it. And he he could like redeem it. He could end it differently the way that it's supposed to be. He has a template on what not to do. And obviously yeah. he had to give them the major plot points so that they could run off and do their own thing. So. George, come on, man. Yeah. Come Kill on. the kid as in a, the wheelchair. As a as a personal favor to me. Come yeah. On, get it on. Get it, get on with it, man. <laughs> yep. Just uh kill the kid in the wheelchair. That's what you have to do. <laughs> That's what you have to do. You have to do it. You have to do it. I but saw that a wasn't video. even oh go I for it. Oh I'm sorry. I saw a video on somebody trying to fix it. Like well, this is how I would have done it. And they did a really good job. They they changed the story slightly. They had things going a slightly different direction. They had Jon Snow be kind of the hero that that we kind of wanted him to be. And uh -huh. Daenerys, so they took a longer, longer time for Daenerys Targaryen to fall into that darkness because she was always it's always meant to be a cautionary tale of the savior figure. Like we're putting our trust in people, looking to them to save us. And then she has this turn, but she doesn't have it on a dime like they did it in the show where all of a sudden yeah. she's just evil and blasted people with fire. And uh, yeah, they don't have the they don't have the uh, the, the cripple boy uh, become king at the end. So, well, that's good. Yeah, he just becomes he just stays there, stays in that bundle of sticks, whatever it is, a hole in the ground. He just stays there. But uh, yeah, that wasn't even on our list. But great way to start it off. You guys all got the idea. So let's talk about one that ended in such a way that I can't believe that there hasn't been any type of talk about a sequel or just, you know, have you heard anything about a district 10 or a district nine sequel? No, man, no, no, no. District nine was one of those movies where it had such good ideas in it. It yeah, was the kind so of cool, lower budget, shaky cam kind of thing. And, and I don't know if, if it was, if maybe it was a, a, a like a love letter or not. What is a love letter? But a uh, like a an audition for this guy. He wanted to make the Halo movie, and he did make like a Halo live action short film. Uh, if you've never seen it, go online and watch it. It's really good. It's like a live before the show came out. It was the mm -hmm. the best thing we had to Halo type action uh, out there on the internet. But um, yeah, man, District Nine. Obviously, a stand-in for some sort of South African apartheid state. Uh, 
love the the cool sci-fi themes and the guy gets yeah. you know he gets infected with the virus he starts turning into uh Charter Kobe starts turning into an alien and they're fighting and the dude is like I can help you his alien buddy's like I can help you if I can get to the ship and then they have a disagreement he's like he's like actually I can't I have to go back to my planet but I'll come back for you and then they have a disagreement Vickers you know kind of his character he turns on him but then he kind of has a change of heart and he comes back to save him and then he ends up getting kind of captured or he's in that mech suit. Yeah. Uh, and there's just awesome, really fun action. And then, and then his buddy gets on the ship and he yep. flies away and then, then the movie that's ends it. and then and Vickers ends. Van der is, uh, is an alien apparently. And that's it. Yep. And he's like, I'll be back for you. I swear I'll be back. And then you just kind of see this, but well, you know, it doesn't directly say, but you just kind of see this alien because he was turning, he was getting all these alien appendages and like his arm would turn into a claw. Mm -hmm. And then you just see this one kind of at the end shifting through the dirt and like walking around and you're like, is that him? Doesn't explicitly yeah. say it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he's still an alien and we haven't seen or heard or anything about a district 10. Cause it was a, I think it was really well done for like the style and the costumes and like the imagination that went into district nine. It's like, yeah. truly, I, I like the fact that it's not like the aliens didn't invade, mm -hmm. you know, they were more just like pests. Yeah. They kind of got there. They got their like middle class aliens that like, yeah, maybe their like ship refugee. went off course refugees, basically. Yeah. yeah they're alien refugees. Yeah. Like they're not an advanced being. They were like just a beings capable of travel that like escaped their home planet and uh yeah just ended up on earth and it's like what would this be like if you know people didn't want them there and you know there was the guys that obviously were obsessed with like the voodoo magic that like thought they yep. could like eat their eat the aliens and gain their powers but they didn't really have any powers <laughs> um, yeah i thought it was really clever awesome sci-fi i'm a big fan of the south african accent bro yes south african yeah yes south african bro. south african is, the, is he life yeah so that's pretty yeah. cool he always gives yeah. good sermons because at least it's in a south african accent that's that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah he's just and afterwards he's like let's go get them blue diamonds bro <laughs> yeah. show like, me the diamond come on you talk, you just told me a sermon about jesus's love for us now you want to go get blood diamonds come on yeah yeah <laughs> trying to screw me over huh? <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah no it was a great movie and i'm just so upset because i would love another one yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they've got, they're obviously Neil Bloomkamp is no stranger to putting messaging into his movies. I never saw Chappie, but he Chappie. did Elysium, right? That was oh, Neil Elysium too, great, right? Yeah. 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 And that was like upper, that was like everybody, all the upper class white and Asian and Middle Eastern people live in space it's, and all the Mexicans yeah. and Matt Damon <laughs> live on earth. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, and, and so you got, there's gotta be more stories that he could tell with district nine. Uh, and I would love to, I like Charlton Copley. I like that character that he played and may, I don't know if it expressly has to be about him, come, you know, getting cured and coming back, but I don't know. There's gotta be, there's gotta be something they can do with it. But I think, I, I think Neil Bloomkamp, I think something tells me he's done with that story. That was, that was something that he's up and coming. He's passionate, right? You know, they had a $30 million budget. It made two, 210 million at the box. Yeah, That's a great. massive success. It put him on the map. It put him up there in the upper echelons of directors working. Mm -hmm. And so now he's, I don't know, something tells me he's just kind of like, he just doesn't care anymore. <laughs> That's lame though. If you like, usually when you get something like that, like the momentum that you get, you know, especially a movie that makes let's see what what would you call that markup that's like uh more than five percent if you ask me <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah right at least more than 12 uh yeah. like that movie is a massive success you know almost quadrupling i don't know what would be like times eight ochoing uh the budget <laughs> you know but uh octupling maybe octupling? i don't know octupling that's, that's, uh, we'll go with oct octupling yeah octupling the quadrupling octupling the budget yeah that's a massive success why wouldn't you want more of that and it opened and it was left for that you know there was literally 
a puzzle piece that was missing and they're like, okay, so like we could totally fill something in, but it just never happened. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. That's, that's such a shame. Such a shame. District nine was a great movie. You know, what's really a shame is, uh, uh, he went on to do, uh, what is it? Chappie and, and, and full disclosure, I've not seen Chappie. I just heard it wasn't all that good. <laughs> oh and yeah, got, it was, it does have uh it does have Hugh Jackman in a mullet though, which is kind of cool. It doesn't. Yeah. Oh, wait, oh, wait, what quick Google dated March 16th, 2024. So about like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Yeah. District 10 confirmation and everything we know about Neil Bloomkin's district nine sequel. What? That's here we go. I take back everything I said. I take it back. You know, this entire past 10 minutes of us just dragging this guy. (laughs) Could have been completely solved if we just took a took a slight uh, Google pause. District, Wait, what now? Now I'm looking at a Reddit. There's like Daniel, director yeah. Neil Bloomkamp temporarily halts plans for District Nine sequel, District Ten. This was seven months ago, though. You said that they're starting back up again, right? This is as this is on Screen Rant. Okay, all right. Okay, summary. Okay. District 9 was successful sci-fi release 29 sequel. District 10 has been uh, discussed for years, but concrete news on its development remains scarce. Uh, Mixed enthusiasm. Oh, so this is even... It says confirmed. Wow, this is clickbait. Oh, clickbait. You know what? I I take back everything I took back, and I give it back again. Yeah, shame. Shame, 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 shame. Now we can move on after I spit on you. Yeah. Spit on you. I spit on you. Okay. All right. So that's just clickbait. That's just conjecture. Now it's, it's just clickbait. Happen, right? Yeah. So. so we take back everything. I take back everything that I took back. That's right. So now yeah. we're back. Now we're back. I fully give it once again. Um, okay. So speaking of unsatisfying endings, I got to jump into the video game realm because this is a legendary. Yeah, sure. This is a legendary series that has yet to be ultimately resolved. It's kind of a meme now us all waiting for half-life three the half-life series legendary i'm so glad that i've gotten a chance to play it more recently on my stream it was suggested to me it's kind of one of those games that a lot of people have grown up playing Mm -hmm. especially i didn't i didn't have a pc growing up it was all console stuff so i didn't catch the half-life series when it first came out but um let's see half-life when did half-life one half-life game um half-life half-life source 2004 2004. okay anyway no no 2000 half-life 1998 1998 that was the first one okay and then there's a lot of these 2004 right and uh it always ends on a cliffhanger the first one ended on a cliffhanger the second one brought the uh the hero back Gordon Freeman, and he's with Alex. Gordon Freeman? Gordon Freeman. Pay attention. Sorry. But uh, Valve is one of those companies, I guess maybe they always want to innovate. They always want to push things forward. And so a lot of the stuff they did in Half-Life and then Half-Life 2 was really innovative. And it's kind of stuff that we take for granted in terms of maybe combat or physics uh, in the Mm. game or, or, uh, I don't know, uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, back then it was kind of innovative and uh, Half-Life 2 came out in 2004 and then nothing but some, you know, I guess they get some DLCs or some little like add on kind of stuff. Half-Life 1 episode, Half-Life 2 episode 1, Half-Life 2 episode 2, 2006, 2007, and then waiting, 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 and waiting for Half-Life 3. All these other things have been kind of like little add ons, little kind of even Half-Life Alex, I think is more of like a, like a, in between cool kind of thing. It takes place before the event in between the events of half-life one and half-life two, and then butt ends into half-life two and then kind of continues the end of half-life two. Cause half-life two you're fighting, you're going along and you, uh, I think her, like Alex's father dies. She's another character. Her father dies. And then she gets captured. That's the end of half-life two. So you can imagine, being a player of that game in 2004 and being like, Oh my God, what an epic cliffhanger of an ending. And then nothing new comes out 
but pretty much ever again. Half Life Alex <laughs> was a great game. It was VR. I haven't played it, but I heard it gets very high marks. You play as Alex, not Gordon Freeman, and more elements and kind of other kind of aspects of the story are introduced. There's G Man, who's kind of this alien character, inter- interdimensional being who who manipulates you and manipulates the events of the game uh, against the Combine, who are the main antagonists. But I mean, can you imagine? Like I, I, I feel, I feel your pain, folks. I'm so glad I didn't play him until recently, because I then I would have been waiting literally 20 years plus for Half Life Three to come out, and it's just kind of a joke at this point because I don't think it'll ever really happen. Maybe Valve is waiting to find some way to innovate once again, some some aspect of gameplay, and then they'll make that the Half Life Three storyline. But I don't know, man. I think. Uh, I think uh, we have we're still we're still going to be waiting. I think that's one of the most epic, not satisfied with the ending kind of things because it's not just that they ended the story and the story wasn't satisfying. It was this they obviously made it a cliffhanger, and it's been decades since we've seen anything brand new. Half Life yeah. Alex ish kind of introduced some other elements, but it didn't. As far as I know, it didn't take place after the events of Half Life Two. It took place in between the events of Half-Life 1, and then a little bit during 2, and then it's kind of like, then it set it up for more storyline. But it's all, that's almost worse. You just rehash some stuff in a in the setting that people are already familiar with, then you end it right around the events of the ending of Half-Life 2, and you explain some stuff, right? You, 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 you kind of tease some things, more mystery, mm. and then you end it. So it's like, it's just like reopening an old wound. For all these yeah. all these players out there, and it's I don't know I don't know what Valve is thinking, doing that, but uh, so so sad, <laughs> uh, so disappointing. Half Life, uh, what a sad you, saga that is. It sounds like you're very passionate about this. I feel like you've been personally robbed. I feel I feel hurt. I feel like I am the avatar for the sadness and frustration and angst of an entire generation of gamers. Okay, so that's not that's an a- easy burden to carry, Cameron. Okay. Yeah, dude, your your spine must be so messed up from all that weight <laughs> on your shoulders. So you get to you get together. Hey, listen, Valve, as a personal favor to me, okay, <laughs> get it together. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh man. Dude. Putting well, out a lot me, of favors today, let, Izzy. Let me ask you something, Cameron. Just in sure. the vein of what we're talking about, um, why is it that you think? Why, why care about stuff like this? Like you're watching a story and there's something about it that is great, but then you see the ending or you experience the ending and like the endings are important. Like, what do you think? Why do you think this conversation has any kind of merit for you? Why you know, do you care? I feel so let's deep dive. Yeah. I feel, tell me your feelings. I feel what do I feel? Do no, you feel, feel like we do? Yeah. No, I feel like, so, in general, when pop, not, not only pop culture, I'm talking about, like, movies, TV shows, their entire existence is to make us feel, right? Yep. Otherwise, why the hell would we watch it? Like, you know, I'd watch paint dry if that's <laughs> if that was the case. If, you know, all this stuff lacked emotion or trying to make me feel a specific way, you know, whether that's scared by watching a horror movie, whether that's feel love watching a romance, whether I feel like a badass watching an action movie, et cetera, et cetera. Like they create different movies, different genres create different feelings. And when you're watching these and it doesn't make you feel the way you wanted it to, I feel like you feel like you got cheated feel like mm-hmm. you wasted your time mm-hmm. you you actually get upset yeah. because you feel robbed um i think that's you know a big thing i think you get so invested into it right when you're watching it you're committing time which time is precious mm-hmm. um you know whether that's 30 minutes for a tv show or three hours for for a movie you know and you you're you're giving something up and then when you're not getting something in return, I feel like that's when it becomes personal. Nice. Yeah. What yeah, there's think? definitely something there, man. No, I totally agree. 
I think it's tougher when the movie, when the piece of pop culture, video game, book, whatever is good mm -hmm. and the ending doesn't satisfy. It can almost ruin the entire experience. Yeah, it can make you want to murder like in misery. <laughs> yeah, see? Yeah, don't mess, yeah. With the, uh, don't mess with the book fans, man. There you go, the book we fans. all like that. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it, it's true, man. The, there is an investment there and there's a hope like you're talking about when you're investing yourself in a story, maybe if it's even if, you know, a lot of times we're fans of these things, fans of video games, fans of sci-fi, fantasy or drama. And there's an expectation of the kind of journey that we're going to go on. Yeah. And when you reach the end and you don't have that satisfaction, like there's something incongruous, there's something that doesn't fit. There's something that doesn't line up or there's something that's just not there. That's absent. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, to the level of investment that you had in watching the story, you're going to be more and more disappointed. Yeah, I think oh, you yeah. it pisses you off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that makes sense, man. That's, I mean, but sometimes they like overdo it. I feel like sometimes they want to give you more when they should give you less in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. um, which that's how I felt with like The Hobbit. Everybody knows. Yeah. Everybody knows I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Yeah. And, you know, I I was thoroughly disappointed with The Hobbit and continued for all three movies. Um, I thought they'd get better. I thought they'd, you know, do it justice. Because The Hobbit is, this is the precursor to The Lord of the Rings, right? This is supposed mm -hmm. to be the beginning. The book, there's only, you know, the, there's only one book, but they decided to take this one book and split it into three movies. I don't know if they were getting greedy. They probably were mm -hmm. because they didn't want to pay all those actors to play orcs. They'd rather just CGI it. That was just a big disappointment, right? Yeah. I was disappointed three times over, and that was hard <laughs> to deal with um, because they, like, did good makeup and effects with the dwarves, Meaning yeah. like they had all these characters in the full characters. makeup and yeah, and makeup and like all crazy kooky and you know, they had fat suits galore. But then when it came to like, you know, I think what's made the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which was earlier and probably harder to make, um, they completely dropped the ball with the practical effects and like actually doing dedicating time to makeup and like putting actors into orc costume. And like, I think that's what made that series so successful is just the attention, the detail in the practical FX versus this Hobbit that they tried to go, you know, it does not even compete, hold weight against Lord of the Rings. Right. Um, and you know, they tried to cut corners and, but give us more of it. And I think it was a huge mistake. I felt cheated that way. Like I would rather, um, instead of, you know, getting three movies, I would just, prefer one really good one yeah you know yep yeah i mean that was the i think that's your first problem right there is the original hobbit is only a little bit like two three hundred pages long it's not long at all they added a bunch of stuff they tried to like yeah. basically yeah i think they a bunch of appendices stuff yeah they tried more. to milk it yeah they yeah. tried to milk it they should have just stuck to the story and just did it put all their eggs in one basket instead of you know trying to spread 12 eggs and three. Yeah, this is, I think I sense new line. I sense a big company wanting another trilogy. And yeah. we know that there was, this was kind of an embattled series too, because after Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, which was a, a massive worldwide earth shattering success. Um, uh, they, they, what it wasn't Guillermo del Toro, I think was originally going to be a part of it. And they were going to do it together, but something happened. I heard that he walked away for a little bit and then came back. So I don't know the whole story. Maybe there's a YouTube video documentary series out there that can tell us how, what actually happened. Yeah. But uh, you can tell, um, yeah, you can tell the whole time. There's all these like little side adventures. There's all these characters that maybe they aren't even mentioned in the books, or maybe they got just like one sentence or two and they're totally filled out and they totally give them so much more screen time. And then there's of course characters. I don't think is Legolas even in the Hobbit. Is he in the Hobbit? He's in the second one. He's in the second. Okay. All right. But uh, like he definitely looks like he is, has a lot of CGI going on. Well, yeah, he's what it's like, what, 10, 15 years later for, uh, for that actor. Uh, yeah. Legolas. Um, 
Orlando Bloom. Orlando Bloom. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, well, here's a great example. Literally headline. And this is according to the Guardian.com said Peter Jackson, quote, I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I made The Hobbit. And he says, Oscar winning director admits he was, quote unquote, winging it and was making it up as I went along for much of the fantasy tri- uh, trilogy's chaotic shoot. That is. Like, there's an entire Guardian interview with Peter Jackson where he's just like, yep, I just, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> oh, man, that is not a good sign. Not Peter Jackson, because yeah, if you trust anybody to handle the material well, he's proven it. With Lord, of the, with Lord of the Rings trilogy, so you you would have high expectations. To find out that he was just winging it, as the, that doesn't inspire me with confidence. Yeah, I mean, I mean, here's a good example right here. He said in the remarkably candid behind the scenes featurette from the Battle of the Five Armies, the Oscar-winning New Zealander details a radical shift in preparation time between the previous Tolkien trilogy, Lord of the Rings, which had three and a half years to prepare, there you go. and its sequel saga. Jackson took over directing duties in 2010 following the departure of Mexican director Guillermo del Toro. Okay, so, all right. Yeah, and uh, according to his comments in the new video, had almost no time to prepare his vision before <sighs> shooting began. He found himself plunged in 21-hour days. So wow. this was just like, we need to make this movie. I'm taking over for Guillermo, and uh, I guess, I guess we're doing this, you know? I even heard a rumor that it was supposed to be two movies originally and they made it into three. I don't know if that's true, but you know, yeah, uh, yeah. that's too bad, man. That, that is uh, too bad. Cause anything that's when you have something that great, you think you'd want to like hold that standard. Yeah. 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 Like there is so much fan. There, there was a reason why there was like a Lord of the Rings cult. Right, it's because that trilogy is so good, and if you put anything on that name, cough, cough, rings of power, <laughs> like you, you have to deliver, or you get an all-out uprising. Yeah, like no yeah, one's man. ever gonna want to touch this again because you're just like soiling it. But uh, let me, I, uh, and I, I want to call out to anybody listening or watching, if you liked the Hobbit trilogy, you got to tell us why. I'm, we're not gonna yeah. judge you. We're not gonna shun you. We love you. No. We love everybody. Them. Everybody has their own taste. Man. But, uh, you know, I just got to know. I, I love hearing people's reasons, especially in the realm of pop culture, because I think there's to some extent it's subjective. I think there's objective quality, uh, yeah. objectively good and bad quality movies and, and pop culture. Sure. But sometimes it's just a matter of opinion. So if you have an opinion and you're like, The Hobbit is great. You got to you got to tell me why. I'm so curious. Yeah. And I'm ready to tell you why you're wrong. But moving <laughs> on. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll do a couple more here. Uh, what, what do you got? I know you have a couple on this list you haven't got to. Yeah. What do you got, Izzy? <sighs> it's hard, man. It's tough. Listen, I'm going to give a shout out, just an honorable mention to all my Star Wars Republic Commando friends. Uh, I played that France. more recently. Friends, my friend fans, my fan friends, my friends. I played them more recently on stream. I'm glad I did. It was, suge- it was a suggestion from the community. It was a great tactical first person shooter. It's team-based tactics. You have to utilize your special forces, uh, Republic Commando, clone troopers. It was great. So awesome. Intentionally, obviously, stops. The game stops at the halfway point in the story, right? Whereas you're one of your buddies is cut off and surrounded by bad guys. You want to go to him, but then Yoda calls you away. It's in the middle of the Clone Wars, and then bam, nothing. That was 2005. That was almost 20 years ago. We've had that game. And so anyway, that's my honorable mention to Star Wars Republic Commando. It should they shouldn't have done them like that. They did them dirty and they need to they need to fix that. But what I will say, this is something interesting because this is not something that this is not a movie that I was disappointed with. This is actually a movie that I love. Big Trouble in Little China is one of those movies that I could watch over and over and over again and never get tired of. I don't know if you have mm. a movie like that in your life where if you just have it on the background, you could watch it anytime. You could even have it on your phone, maybe in the seat right next to you as you're driving. I'm not saying to do that, but I'm saying hypothetically, if you were going to have a movie in your car, Big Trouble Little China. I love that movie. And at the end of the movie, if you haven't seen it and you should, spoilers, he's in his car. He saved the day. He's in his semi truck uh, rolling down the road and it kind of pans to the back in the rain and the storm. Then a monster kind of creeps up. It's like on the back part of the tractor trailer like creeping towards him. And that's the end of the movie. We never find out. It's like kind of this, like it's not over yet kind of thing. I would love to see, I would love to see a big trouble in little China 
but maybe if they had had a chance to make it a couple of years after the first one came out, because I do not want to see any properties that I love be remade or any sequels today because the environment in Hollywood is just not the same storytelling environment as it used to be. Their priorities are much different. Um, you know, Jack Burton would be, I mean, it's, it's, you know, uh, make her a chick and make her gay kind of thing. Like they would, they would do that to her, you know, they would do that to Jack Burton. He would be yeah. emasculated. They'd have a strong female character that is better at him than everything that would always put him down. He'd be, a, and here's the thing in big trouble, little China, he is a bit of a, he is kind of incompetent. He is a bit of a, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed in the midst of his care, the characters that are surrounding him, but he's got it where it counts, you know? And that's what's, that's Be the magic tough. of his character. Uh, and, and, and freaking uh, uh, Jack Burton played by Kurt Russell. He's, yep. he's so great. He's got that charm and he still looks good, man. He could still, I would love to see them do something in, in the fantasy Hollywood in my mind. I would like them to make a sequel to big trouble in little China, but we all know that it's just, that just can't get made today. There's, there'd be too many people up in arms. There'd be too like, cultural appropriation or not handling Chinese culture. Well, it would never get funded because most of our studios are funded by Chinese companies anyway. Yeah. You know, like like Braun and Tencent. A, yeah. Yeah. This was a national disgrace when it came out. <laughs> you know, China was like, take it down. They were like North Korea when the interview came down. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know, I heard uh, if you listen to the commentary on the movie, apparently not many people were totally offended in the Chinese, you know, like it was, it was, it wasn't like the Chinese community was offended. It was like other people being offended on behalf of the Chinese community. Oh yeah. And no, the I'm Chinese people were like, joking. no, we didn't care. You know? So. Yeah. I'm completely joking. That seems to be the case with anything. You ever see that video of the kid on the street and he's like, uh, he dresses up, he puts a fake mustache on He's a white kid. He puts a fake mustache on a sombrero and a poncho and he goes to a college campo and he's like, does this offend you? And everybody's like, yeah. And they're like, are you Mexican? He's like, no. And then he goes to like straight up like little Mexico and talks to all the Mexicans. And they're like, nice poncho. <laughs> 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 yeah, dude. It's, yeah. Everybody's everybody yeah. sucks. Yeah. Getting um, offended on behalf of other groups is kind of a national pastime these days. So. Yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, I do you want to know a dirty little secret. I've never seen big. Oh, I've never seen this movie. Don't tell me that, Cameron. Oh my gosh. Well, here's the thing, man. I, I could tell you to watch it because I am such a big fan. But I saw it when it came out in theaters. I was a little kid. It just blew my mind with yeah. fantasy and stuff. It's a John Carpenter classic. I think it's right up there with the thing in terms of his best movies of all time. And like I said, it's got everything. It's one of those things. It was Rush Hour before Rush Hour was around. It was the yeah. a blending of eastern and western action it had kung fu action in it and it had american you know uh, bang bang kind of western action in it and yeah. they did a lot of good stuff with it man jack burton's a great character and uh uh so if you if you put it on your list you can put it low on your list man because i don't know if you're going to be affected by it the same way that i was because i saw it man i saw it when i was a kid so i mean hey too late for me i like to watch things <laughs> so i will be watching this one just because i got to Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, let's do. We'll do like one more each, I think. But uh, honorable mention, since you did an honorable mention, All right. I would like to say, especially for closure, you know, a TV show that ends almost. And we're talking a TV show that's been on for like almost two decades now, um, or two decades. Uh, Law and Order SVU Special Victims <laughs> Unit. I just have to shout it out because I've been I've been rewatching it all with uh, with Sydney. And basically every episode is a cliffhanger. Uh, oh you get like zero closure every episode. Like they have this crazy buildup character development. Uh, you know, obviously a crazy, the SVU, the special victims units is, is a unit within the NYPD that uh, deals with sexual crimes. Mm -hmm. So pretty much like rapes and kidnappings and all that stuff. Nice. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of emotional attachment to this, to these characters because they are doing the job that nobody else wants to do. Right. If you're working in homicide, you're just working with, you know, your victims are all dead, but in SVU, you're working with live victims, you know, people that are there living and breathing. So it's pretty hard, but like all the time they go, like they always finish in the courthouse and most of the time it just doesn't go the way you want or it just ends. Like, for example, and I'm going to get real specific here, season six, episode eight. Uh, 
<laughs> I just watched it last night, and it's been on my brain uh, because there was this big, their big scandal. Uh, you have not your favorite actress from uh, The Knight's Tale. What's her name that plays? Like, oh, Shannon Salzman? Yeah. Oh, no. Well, she's in it. And not to mention the people that are in. If you watch the old SVUs, so many actors, so many in, in their beginning. Like, yeah. Beginning. yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, my God, there's so-and-so in the next episode. You're like, oh, my God, there's so-and-so. Everybody has been in SVU. Um, plus, I don't understand how uh, this is not turning into an honorable mention, so I might as well just finish it off. Uh, because not to mention is like you get to see all these you know actors before they got big, or you you know I always in my mind think about like the eight your agent right. Imagine you're you're in Hollywood and you're trying to make it big, yeah. or you're in and you're in New York and you want to be an actor and you got an agent. He gives you a call and he's like, "Boy, son." I got the role of a lifetime for you to get you started. He's like, oh, thanks, Tony, or whatever his name is. And he, he's like, what am I playing? He's like, okay, you're going to report to you're gonna report to Fox Studios, and you are playing a pedophile rapist who has schizophrenia and is a transgender. And you're like, oh, man, that's the role of a lifetime. <laughs> like, could you imagine? You're like, how – a lot of these things – because they're terrible. They're terrible roles. And you're just like, yeah, I'll play that. I'll play that. Anytime but, you want. I mean, you know, as a performer, man, you're a performer too. Like for an actor, somebody who really loves sinking their teeth into a role and something that a role that has depth and stuff. I can see that being very appealing for an actor, you know, yeah. not just I like, how I'm are people going to see me? Yeah. yeah. But it's like, oh, wow, this has so many layers to it. I got to understand this and that and the other thing. Uh, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> that's another way to look at it. I like how specific it is. Yeah. I mean, you can get it. But anyways, this episode, season six, episode eight. Right. And uh, you have that actress and you have this guy and she's a student and he's a college professor. And I guess they have an, in an inappropriate, intimate relationship. And uh, she's known as a, a little bit of a Jezebel. Uh, right. And then she's also a little bit of a drunken. But then also he's an older man that tends to date younger chicks and students. So here's irresponsible. She's irresponsible. You don't know what happens. They're both covered in bruises and scratches. Uh, she's wasted cries rape. He's like, it was consensual. She just likes it rough. Cause she's a, a, you know, she's a freak. She's a freakazoid. And then it goes, you know, people take both sides and, you know, he loses all his job, but then her reputation's tarnished and it gets to the courthouse and, you know, it, the detectives are flip flopping. Cause they're like, she's a liar. Oh, uh, but he's, you know, doing this, sending death threats and sending whatever. And then it gets to the courthouse and the judge is like, uh, how do you play? Or she's like, has the jury come to a verdict? And they're like, we have your honor. Uh, we find the defendant cuts the credits. What? And I'm like, dude, are you kid? After like 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes of like, you'd going back and forth or you, and you take a side in the, right in the beginning, you take sides, <laughs> right? Based on your experience. Um, but like, yeah, it, you, and it's emotional. Cause you're like, Oh dude, I just kept looking at Sydney every time she would mess up because I took the guy's side in the beginning because I'm just like, she threw a champagne bottle through a windshield because she was wasted and then the cops came and she was about to be arrested because the taxi driver was like, arrest this woman. You know, she's crazy. And then she's like, don't arrest me. I've been raped. And I was just like, oh, she's copping out. She don't want to go to jail. Uh... And then, uh, but then, yeah, it was just, you know, it was yeah, super I wish they wouldn't do that. I wish they'd just be a normal TV show and like, you know, <laughs> just finish a plot. Uh, it's funny, man. I was doing a little research while you were talking. Apparently they had a, a voting thing where they let the audience vote on whether or not they thought he was guilty. And most people thought he, he was innocent. I, I thought he was innocent. I totally thought he's innocent. I don't like her. Yeah. yeah. Cause Shannon Salzman is not a good performer. So I wouldn't believe her. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you didn't like her at night still. You don't like her today. I don't like her in anything. I'm sure she's a nice lady, but yeah. my, uh, my final entry into this epic episode will be, uh, the ending of lost man. Ooh. Lost was another one of those popular shows, man. It was worldwide. I remember getting together with friends every weekend or every week to watch the latest episode. People were always be talking about it. This was before the kind of the internet really caught on. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. um, it was it was wild, man. It, and uh, that last season, apparently it was rushed. Apparently they maybe thought they were going to get another season or two and they had to wrap mm -hmm. things up. And so like the original, there were the original inhabitants on the island that never got to be fleshed out. There was stuff that happened super quick and things, you know, change over uh, and characters dying left and right. And um, 
and yeah, and, and Jack dies and, and the, some people get off. And so anyway, I, I would, I feel like lost was such a great show because it was all about the mystery. What's going to happen next. What's around the corner. What's over here. Mm -hmm. Who are these people? They were, I thought they were pretty good at rolling out the mystery slowly. Uh, and I would love to see a sequel series to that. It's same universe, same, maybe not the same, maybe the same Island, but like, what other aspects of the island do we not understand? Are there people that go back to the island and try to yeah. discover, rediscover it, you know, or maybe there's a corporation or a national entity that tries to get in there and some people are lost again. And they, and, you know, I feel like there's a lot more secrets that the island could hold. Hugo ended up being the, the caretaker. If you don't know, he was one of the characters on the show. He ended up being kind of the caretaker of the island at the end. What, what happened to him? Did he pass it on to somebody else? I feel like they, if they did it right, which, you know, who knows? If they did it right, I feel like that that could have a cool uh, uh, could have a cool follow on, and I I don't mind. I don't think it's like sacred like some things are, where I wouldn't mind seeing a sequel to the Lost show. Well, that's a good point, man. I haven't seen. I started Lost. I've seen like the first season, uh, but I yeah I know that it was a big thing when it was uh, when it was out. I remember it was like every Friday or Thursday it'd come mm -hmm. on TV. I think it was Thursday, Dude, yeah. First of all. Do you just remember when like that was a thing? Yeah, man. You used to wait for you used to wait a yeah. week for a new. Like, oh, it's Thursday, Thursday yeah. eight p.m. on CBS. Yeah, whatever. yeah. You couldn't just stream it whenever you want. You had to show up at a certain time. Yeah. On your TV. Crazy. So crazy. Times. Oh, times have changed. You couldn't record it, you know, before that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. I remember when the I. It, I, I was super young, but I remember people like coming up in arms about like some of the twists and loss and some of the deaths and the final season or something like that. Yeah. Um, but that's a really good one. I got to I actually haven't finished it, so I have to do that. Or I worth or I'm it's not going to. It's I'd the worth it's it. worth the journey you take, you know. Yeah. The even though the last season, the last season was not it's not as abysmal. It doesn't reach Game of Thrones season eight level, yeah. but it was kind of disappointing. It was like it felt rushed. That's OK. Right. That's unfortunate, but good, good way to end our little, uh, our little debate here. Um, but let's move on to our fan question that comes to us from Dylan via email. And remember, if you guys got questions for us, send us a email at the piece to the PCFM podcast at gmail.com. We love seeing what you got. And there's a chance it might be featured on an episode, just like Dylan's question here, which he wonders. What weapons, in your opinions, are the most overhyped weapons in military video games and movies? Good question. Yep. My is answer. Yeah, my right. my answer is the crossbow. I, I don't understand why anybody likes this, especially in uh, video, video games specifically, like Helldivers Two coming out with a cross explosive tip crossbow. I, really? I, I I just don't get what the unless there's some sort of actual noise advantage, like you can't get discovered or they can't pick up on your location as easily. It's just it's get a grenade launcher, get some other explosive tipped or explosive projectile weapon like mm. a grenade launcher, or whatever, and and just do that. I don't. There's some mystique about it. Maybe we're all big Daryl Dixon fans from The Walking yeah, Dead. Yeah, Walking Dead. Yeah, it's just I don't know. It's it looks cool, but I think it's totally impractical. Um, I yeah, know. I mean, I agree with you, man. Like, uh, you first of all, a, you need a very powerful crossbow to get any type of distance. I feel like, yeah, and then crossbow bolts versus arrows. Um, typically, and correct me if I'm wrong, crossbow people out there, but like crossbow bolts are much shorter. I'm assuming this affects their trajectory. Um, they are quiet though, so yeah. that might be the thing. But you also have to be kind of close. It's not like you can take a 200 meter crossbow shot and yeah. have it, you know, and have it be like super deadly. Yeah. Um, but no, that's a good one, man. Crossbows. I have like, I think chainsaws are super stupid. <laughs> um, yeah, and you're a Gears yeah. of War fan. I love Gears of War. Awesome video game concept, but like, I don't think they're practical at all. They're super loud. Um, you know, what happens if your chain breaks? Like, whenever I see, like, first of all, uh, really cool scenes, like great features in movies. I mean, you have some iconic scenes like Evil Dead using chainsaws. Uh, you know, obviously, Chainsaw Massacre is a big thing, um, but also, like, you have it, that crazy chainsaw fight in Mandy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, that's just cool to watch, but I think it's super impractical. Like, wielding a chainsaw, I don't think is effective. Uh, the chains can break, and after they break, like, they're useless. So, like, imagine if... I'm pretty sure if you, like, use chainsaw on a metal object, like, the chain will just snap. Yeah. Like, it's not practical. They're super loud. They run out of gas. Like, 
I don't think they're practical. But also honorable mention to uh, flamethrowers, I think, are super overhyped. <laughs> Just because, I mean, they look super cool. Like seeing a super uh, a flamethrower go off, amazing. Yeah. I would hate to get covered in flamethrower. It's instant death. Yeah. Um, but the range isn't that long. You have a giant gas tank on your back. You are like way wider, and you are a target immediately. Yes. Um, and you will die. That is the thing. There's a crazy little fact um, that in World War II, the average life expectancy of a flamethrower was five minutes once they hit the beach <laughs> flamethrower operator just if yeah you were, you're the guy man you're like you're uh, the guy a good oh life. man yeah you yeah you're just like okay i guess i lost the lottery here <laughs> uh because you were your life your no shit your life expectancy was five minutes once like in okinawa or in uh japan like during the pacific yeah their life expectancy was five minutes they all died I know there was one interview with this old guy that somehow survived <laughs> and he was just like I was the only one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's yeah. awesome, man. Oh, Super geez. crazy. Yeah. But that's my answer. Good answer, man. All right, yeah. Gam, Cam, Gam, Cam with the Gam, Gams. Gam. Uh, it's time for the game, my friend. And this all one right. is what do you all got? mine. I got a game for you called All the Closure You Can Handle. I will give you the name of a character, and you tell me if they died or lived in a specific movie, game, or TV show. That's it. You got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. You don't even need to tell me how they died or how they lived their lives after they lived. Let's just see where your antiques take you. Okay, so all I have to do is tell you what universe they're in? No, you just have to tell me if they live or die. Oh, oh, okay. I misunderstood that. Yeah, no, I, 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 you just tell me, like, this is the warm up. Tony Stark, Infinity War. Oh, he dies. He lives in Infinity War. Oh, in the movie specifically, not in like yeah, the entire. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, but so in Tony Endgame, Stark, yes, he does die. But yes. in Infinity War, he lives. I see. Okay, I understand now. Yeah. All right. Next one. First official question. Ready? And Ellen Ripley, Sigourney Weaver from Alien Three. Alien 3, I believe she dies. That is correct. She does die. Yeah. Do you know how she dies for bonus points? Um, She kills herself, right? To kill the alien. She's pregnant. Yep, she got a queen with, in her Yeah, she got a queen belly. inside of her. And I don't specifically remember. Does she dive into hot lava? She dives into hot lava, yep. Molten okay. steel, I Molten think, specifically. Steel. But uh, yeah. I'll give it to you, yeah. Hot mag, red hot, hot magma. Red hot magma death. Magma death. Good stuff, man. Okay. All right. Number two, Private Reben. This is Ed Burns' character in Saving Private Ryan. Private Ed Reben. Burns. Edward Burns' character. Can I look up what he looks like just so I know who it is? Look up Edward Burns. Yeah, I'm looking up Ed Burns. All right. Don't don't type in Ed Burns. Oh, Save yeah. Burns. Okay. Um, He's, oh, I remember. Uh, He's the one with the bar. He has the Browning automatic rifle all the time. Oh, okay. Does he survive? I want to say he survives. Good instincts, Cam. He does live. He's one of the guys, yeah. again, that does live. Uh, Private Ryan lives, obviously. He lives. I think there's maybe Upham lives. There's mm -hmm. only like one or there's only like three or four of them that live out of the whole crew. Yeah, no, it's a brutal final battle scene. Yeah, yeah, it is, man. Max Martini's in that. He's one of the guys on Matt Damon's unit. I just like that actor. He's done a lot of good uh, military Max roles. Martini? Max Martini. Max Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen this dude. guy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, oh, he plays. He plays in Thirteen Hours. Yeah, yeah. Good guy. Yeah, good actor. Good dude. Good actor. There's a lot All of right. veteran. He does those do a lot of veteran stuff. You'll see him at VME events. But uh, uh, I see. is he a veteran? No, he's not. He's just a supporter. Yeah, uh, he has see, a great so. movie called sergeant something where it's like he's a he's a homeless vet who goes on kind of a a road trip across america on a motorcycle and does he steal a, the motorcycle he does steal the motorcycle yeah, yeah i know what you're yeah. talking about very <laughs> sad 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 movie. that yeah very sad but uh yeah i know okay. what you're talking about yeah all right okay. sidebar but let's get on with it next one you got these bo both of these right so next one glenn Ree, played by steven yoon in the walking dead Glenn, terrible death, brutal terrible death. death. Yeah. Yeah. This was like, this was actually gave me PTSD how oh. bad he was killed. Oh, like, no. he was such a good character. I remember Sydney and I watched Walking Dead religiously. Oh. And I knew it was coming. I, cause I, cause I remember I knew it was coming, but I never actually saw the scene. And it is 
it is brutal oh man yeah like it is scarring like you feel like you just lost a friend dang dude that's rough speaking speaking i should have brought this up like closure talking about closure endings cliffhangers uh walking dead i should have mentioned that the whole series or just parts of it like no uh, rick 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 uh which uh rick from walking dead uh was played uh yeah he's rick grimes played by andrew lincoln they just kill him off randomly the most well, they important. take him away. They take him yeah. away. Doesn't he get into well, a helicopter? Because he's got a show he coming out. Yeah, he, they take him away in a helicopter. Yeah. And, they, and they're like, we're going to bring you back. End, right? No, he never does. Ever. Oh. He never, ever, ever comes back. It is the, and it's out of nowhere, too. There's no like build up to it. It's just like, oh, dude, that was actually the most pissed off I've ever been. You want to talk about like feeling robbed? <laughs> well, yeah, are, are I, you going to watch the next, the spinoff series with him and Michonne? Yeah, he does I probably live. will. The ones who, yeah, I, if he, yeah, if they run into each other, I'll be so happy. I thought he was going to come back because they had the Daryl Dixon spinoff. Yeah, where he's in and, London uh, or whatever, or Paris. Yeah, he's in London. Oh, he's in England, and uh, he literally, or uh, he's in France. I think he's in France, Paris, France. I, yeah, I think he's in France. Yeah, but anyways, he's in France, and like he says, somebody's he's looking for someone at the end of Daryl Dixon, and like. I thought it was going to be Rick. Uh, I thought it was going to be, if it was Rick, I was going to lose my mind. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't. And I was thoroughly disappointed, but anyways, yeah. Walking dead. That's my insert in the game. Let's keep hey, playing. Good. Good insert, man. Good. Uh, unresolved issues. All right. Next one. John Marston from red dead redemption. I've never played the game. So this is going to be a 50, 50. I'm going to say he dies. Good instincts, man. He does die at the end of Red Dead Redemption. I've actually only ever played Red Dead Redemption 2, and he it's a prequel, so he's alive through that whole thing, and then it kind of dovetails into the events of Red Dead Redemption 1, which takes mm. place after the events of Red Dead Redemption 2, which is very confusing. But uh, good character. I know he's a big fan. He's a fan favorite. But you got it right, man. He does live. Okay, or, right I mean, on, he does right die. He does die. Right? He does die. Yeah. yeah. Didn't. Didn't play the odds on that one. <laughs> All right, next, uh, the world famous blockbuster, absolutely, totally successful film, Battleship, Admiral Shane, which is played by Liam Neeson in Battleship. Um, this is the one with Brianna in it, right? Mm-hmm. I actually didn't mind this movie. I thought it was kind of. I fun. didn't mind it either. I thought it was kind of fun with like the little boats that came out. Um, yeah, they got the old guys to to bring the old battleship out of mothballs. Yeah, you know, and they, they they're not going to sing this battleship. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how it ends. I do not, but I'm just going to fifty fifty. I'm going to say he uh, he dies. Oh, your first mistake cameron he does live admiral shane liam neeson yeah you don't kill off liam neeson yeah you don't kill off liam. not even in the gray not even in the gray apparently maybe i don't know yeah we don't know we there's another the one yeah. yeah that was on the that was on the list i just didn't get to it <laughs> so yes he he does live uh i think uh one of the scars guards who plays his brother dies in it but uh mm. it's probably for the best okay yeah next one we got two more two more let's knock them out Chris Mannix, played by Walton Goggins in The Hateful Eight. Chris Mannix, Walter Goggins. Can I look up the actor so I know his Walton, face? Walton Goggins. He's going to be in oh, the new yes. Netflix or the new the Amazon. The new Sheriff. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen The Hateful Eight, actually. Oh, you haven't? I have. It's it's very good. There's actually a good story in it. Oh, okay. Um, cool. like an, like an, uh... Walton Goggins. He lives. He lives. All right, he, you're right. He does live, man. Good for yeah, you. There's a big shootout at the end. It's a big twist. You should watch it. There's actually a story about this. So you ever heard of the guitar company Martin? Yeah, this is where they had the, the Martin guitar. The priceless guitar. Priceless guitar. Yeah, my dad works for Martin. Okay. So yeah, it was this. For the listeners that don't know, they had this guitar on set that Martin let them use for a prop. And... Uh, there's this scene where Kurt Russell's character has, he's a, he's a, bo- a bounty hunter. He's, they call him the hangman. Yeah. And he brings in this one woman that he's going to hang. And she's sitting there and she's playing guitar. And uh, they have this priceless, this thing was like one of the first Martins made. It was 
it could sell for millions and millions of dollars. Oh, no. And in the in the uh, in the script, Kurt Russell was gonna sm- take the guitar from her and smash it to bits. But they were supposed to switch the guitars out. But Quentin Tarantino apparently knew that they never switched them out what? and wanted a real reaction from the character. So nobody told Kurt that they didn't switch it out. So he, in the scene, he grabs this priceless guitar that Martin lent them and smashes it to pieces, multi-million dollar guitar. And the actress that was playing, you know, obviously was there. He wanted a real authentic reaction oh, out of her, no. which I think is a douche move. That's a douche move. Yeah, I that would, I would, I would expect Quentin Tarantino to do something like that. Yeah. So Kurt Russell smashed a multi-million dollar guitar. And then Martin was like, we are never doing this ever again. Yeah. You've just broken our trust in all of mankind. Yeah, in yeah. all of Hollywood's never yep. getting a guitar again. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you're doing good, man. Uh, that's a good story, by the way. You're doing good. You only got one wrong. You got one more left. Okay. Commander Shepard in Mass Effect 2. Oh, I haven't played Mass Effect 2, but I'm pretty sure you've talked about it enough, but I don't remember, so I'm just going to send one in the dark. He, Commander Shepard, he's going to live. He does live. He lives until the third movie where he either sacrifices himself, chooses to transcend or destroys the big machine at the end. I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, but he, he's the main character of the, of the main, of the, sh- of the show, the story basically, but uh, I got gotcha. the game rather. Okay. That was a fun game, dude. I had that fun. was a good game, man. You did really yeah, well. You only game. got one wrong. Okay. Well, when it's 50, 50, I better, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's 50, 50. <laughs> no, you folks, were, the odds were in your favor, man. Thank you for spending all this time with us. Thank you, Izzy, for the excellent game and the excellent conversation. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Any remarks, Izzy? No, man. Check out our uh, our, our Pop Culture Field Manual YouTube. That's where I'm going to be placing all that new and fresh content. we got the Game fresh. Recon, which is a lot of fun. Uh, it's back to our Gameology roots. So we're doing game, yes, sir. game uh, reviews and reactions. And maybe we'll do some uh, television show or movie reactions as well in the military realm. Absolutely. Well, that's all we got for you this week. Tune in next week and keep music.